Well, hello and welcome back to the Basic Bible Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Thompson, and we are welcoming back to the podcast my friend Ben Everson, evangelist, musician, blogger, author, the guy that does it all. Ben, welcome back. <laughs> Thanks so much. It's been a long time. Good to be back on with you. And I hope I didn't ruin your whole reputation in ministry by calling you a friend. Yeah, no, absolutely not. Glad to claim it. <laughs> All right. And uh, for those of you who don't know, in fact, if you just enjoyed our introduction music that was composed by none other than Ben Everson. So uh, thanks again for that, Ben. I, I like that our theme song. Oh, but wonderful. We're, yes. We're talking That's about... Really using it. That's great. <laughs> That's good. We're talking about worship here and specifically corporate worship within the church. And I thought you'd be a good person to talk to you about that. And this is something that's been kind of just kicking around my head for a while. Cause I think it's something that we need to talk about. And because I, I feel like there are extremes within the church. One extreme goes to the far, far depths of this whole, this whole thing becomes an orchestrated concert. And I don't mean orchestrated in the sense of musically, but a, a, right. a planned out, basically almost like a concert. And then there's the other side where it's just like a second thought where I guess we have to do something to fill the time before the preaching. So let's pull out something. And, um, you know, three minutes before the service, we're jotting down hymn numbers um, for the pianist. To play. <laughs> and, you know, both of those, I think are, are the extreme which we want, we want to avoid. Um, although I'm more comfortable, <laughs> I don't want to say with the concert, but, putting more planning into it than doing the three minutes. So, um, but you know, you're, you're not only a musician, but you're an evangelist. You have been to many churches and I'm sure you've seen everything that, you know, running the gambit uh, on the spectrum. Um, as we're talking about this idea of church worship first, let's establish the fact that I, and I, and I, I'm not even going to finish this as a question, but I want you to comment on this. Let's establish the idea that God cares about worship. Mm, yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, God cares about worship. I think that uh, all throughout scripture, uh, we see examples of this. And uh, strangely enough, uh, and this might take us down a rabbit hole that we don't want to chase this time around. But uh, I, as I've been doing, I've been doing some study recently on worship. And primarily, we get a lot of our instructions from the Old Testament. As far as, I mean, it's more narrative, obviously. Yeah. So, you know, you're always wrestling with, okay, what's just narrative? What what prescriptions do we take from right. the Old Testament, you know, et cetera. But uh, I do think that uh, sometimes the New Testament, uh, particularly, you know, the age of grace, the authors are assuming upon one's knowledge yeah. of what's been done in the past, et cetera. But leaving that as it is, I guess, um, uh, the sacrifice of praise that we give to the Lord is vital. And and I'm not going to play games with you or anyone else on, well, everything we do is worship to the Lord. Okay. Yes, we know that. Right, okay. Right. You know, all right. Yeah, we know that. But we're, we're talking about, like you said at the top, corporate worship. How can we, how can we do this better? How can we do it right? Where have we been wrong? Things like that. I do see all kinds of stuff. And like you, I, I think we all have tendencies. My tendency is going to slide more towards the programmed part because I am a, I'm going to use the term a lot of people don't like, but I am a performer. Um, and a lot of people react against that. They say, well, we shouldn't perform. It should be ministry. Well, uh, anytime we're in front of people, there's going to be an element of performance there. Right. Right. So, you know, that, and that's, that's not antithetical to ministry. Being conscious of what we're doing when we're in front of people is a wise thing to do so that we're not distracting, yeah. etc. So uh, I don't see those things as antithetical, but I do have to guard myself sometimes because if I could, uh, for sake of having things go smoothly, I would program just about everything. You know, I would I would have it all boom and all like on a video track and all that type of stuff. I would just boil it down to that. Uh, that would be my tendency too. Uh, but I've seen all things, you know, all kinds of extremes as I travel too. So that's true. Well, let's, let's talk about that because that's a, it's an interesting idea because we do we do want to do things decently and in order. Um, mm -hmm. First Corinthians tells us that the that the service uh, as, as we worship together 
it should be done in order. There, there, we, you know, in, in the context of First Corinthians, they're talking about speaking in tongues and things going crazy, and and you don't want that. So you you want an order. You want to plan it. It is important, absolutely. So where where can you go wrong? Where where does where does the train go off the tracks? Because you do want to allow for some sort of uh, allowing the spirit to work, yet. You do want it, it's a, you know you're you're a preacher as well and you know there's there's often that that tension in the sermon where you need to do your preparation you need to study this text you have to understand the context understanding the languages even to properly interpret this and to ap- apply this but at the same time sometimes you get up there and you just feel God working in you maybe something that you didn't prepare for but man you know you don't want to get in front of the Holy Spirit and, and stop that right. Well, just like there's different personalities of preachers, uh, some guys are hardcore manuscript guys. And I mean, they're just all the way through. And our good friend Jonathan Edwards would have been in that category. Uh, Anyway, you know, uh, I know different time, different place, but still sinners in the hands of the anger of an angry God wasn't dramatic. He just read it, you know, so God can work that way. But then you have also some personalities that I think you and me would fall more in line with which is a little bit more extemporaneous working from solid study so why can't churches be the same you know why can't worship for lack of a better term worship leaders uh have that same uh uh, kind of spectrum to where they're going to be you know a church in southern california is going to have a different feel and a different um uh what they're used to than a church in the hills of kentucky you know uh everything down the line from what we're wearing to the instrumentation. I mean, all that stuff is going to be different and, you know, or the upper peninsula of Michigan or inner city Detroit or whatever. So uh, you say, where can we go wrong? That's a great question. I think we go wrong when we start to equate whatever system we use to set up, we start to equate that with this is God's way. Like, you know, <laughs> the, I think that's where we, we cross over that line from good and wise planning to, oh, now I am the Pope, you know, <laughs> I tell, you know, that this can't, that, nope, not allowed to do that or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, I know there's ditches with that too, but I think that's where we start drawing a line is yeah. uh, we have to say, hey, okay, this is what we're going to do here. It's similar to, it's similar to institutional standards in one sense. Yeah. Because you and I both know there's people out there that really chafe against the standards that they willfully put themselves under yeah. <laughs> to go to Bible college or Christian college or whatever. And they're like, I can't stand these rules. All right, well, then why'd you go there? <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, all right, uh, if an institution equates it with holiness, then we have a problem. Yeah. You know, uh, so, um, yeah, that's that, that's along the lines of what I would think is where we can start to go wrong, equating our box that we set up to help yeah. keep things organized, equate that with, you know, application, equate the application with a principle. Okay. So, you know, I didn't give you any of this stuff ahead of time. So right? I just gave you the broad topic. Um, <laughs> one of the issues I want to bring up, and I'm really curious, because we haven't talked about this. And uh, okay. I hope we don't get you in too much trouble, but I don't think I'm going to. Um, <laughs> Go for it, yes. When it comes to the idea of, of corporate worship, worshiping together, um, you know, I was a part of a church uh, fairly recently where, and, well, even, even now, um, the churches I grew up with were very similar. We, we sang hymns, and that's great. We had almost like a, you know, the set liturgy or we'd never call it a liturgy um (laughs) the set pattern the order of worship we see we we sing two hymns announcements another hymn sermon whatever um and the choir and there's always a special before the message um it's always called a special yes a special (laughs) not a performance not a performance um (laughs) but you know the church i'm going to now there the choir is no more uh, even the, the quote special is gone and, and there's some, tr- they want to emphasize the corporateness of this. So I don't want the choir. I don't want special, but we're going to focus on just the, the singing, uh, in, in the corporate singing where everyone's singing together. Um, 
And, you know, there's part of that. I get that. I, I love the idea that we are all before the throne together with the same song, lifting our praise to the Lord. Um, and I get that, that, that we don't want the performance of someone, but there's part of me that misses that choir. I love uh, choir music. And yes, I even, uh, well, I would never perform myself. I enjoy hearing other uh, people, people doing that. Um, talk to us about that. Is, is there, um, do, do you think there's too much of an emphasis on, well, first of all, I want to ask you, do you see that trend or is that just me? Um, and is there some sort of, what, what's the philosophy behind that? Can we, can we still worship together while listening to one person? Uh, Cause I know you do that in, in um, your concerts and I, and I don't have a problem with that at all. Um, I am rambling here. So I'm just sort of throw it over to you then. Yeah, um, Joel, that's great. Yeah. Well, you're painting a picture for folks and uh, you know, you want all your listeners from whatever background it is to be able to understand where you're coming from. A hundred percent. I see this. Why do we, you know, what frustrates me? Why do we have to be so pendulum based? Yeah. You know, why don't we always have to swing one thing to the other? I guess it's human nature. I know that I do the same thing uh, yeah. because yeah. we're seeing, I am seeing in churches in general, it's a little hard to explain because usually when I'm coming in, obviously they don't have a problem with someone else coming in and doing right. something because I'm, right. I'm, you know, doing a whole concert for them. But as, as I've watched and read what people are saying, there's definitely a move towards congregational singing and all that type of stuff. Well, good. That's awesome. Right. But if you look at the, your old Testament patterns that they did, if we're drawing from that, and I don't think there's a problem with that, doesn't matter if you know you're dispensationalist like me or not, or you've got different views or whatever. We yeah. we draw those pictures. Well, you've got both examples. You have examples where the whole group of them all saying and praise the Lord, but then you also have examples of those who are trained to specifically go to the Lord vicariously for others. Yeah. So it's it, you know it's like hey let's all be mechanics. Well, we can all learn to change our oil pretty much, but you know I'm not going to be the guy that's going to swap out an engine. Right. So why do we you know why why is it in our churches that we can't some churches are like nope we just have the special people that do all the special yeah. stuff and it's, it's spectator oriented. Well, that's wrong. Right. I, I don't have a problem saying that. That's just wrong. OK, because you're cutting people out. But on the other hand, uh, you've got uh, church congregations where some of them can't even carry tune in a bucket. That's not a, that's yeah. not an insult. They would tell you that. So what we're trying to do then as the choir or the ensemble or some people praise team or whatever you want to call it. That what they're trying to do is vicariously take the congregation's heart and emotions and will and our thoughts as a congregation and vicariously praise the Lord for those who can't do it to that same level. Um, you know, I, I heard, I love hearing specials done. I, I call them specials too. <laughs> but I love hearing ones done on instruments that I can't play. And I am a musician. So, you know, I can do a fair amount of stuff. But, you know, there's some like a harp. Uh, I just encountered a harpist that's excellent in her field. Mm. And to hear her just play, she didn't actually play in church. She was just playing beforehand. And my heart was moved because, wow, just the skill that it takes, like David, yeah. you know, uh, the harp was a little different than what we think it was a harp now, but still it's that same principle, right? So I, I love to think of that vicariously praising the Lord is something that a choir or another group of musicians should be trained to do. Right. And that's, a, and you can still praise the Lord together corporately while listening to uh, someone who knows what they're doing. I mean, you don't want yeah, to. And, ab absolutely. Yeah. And we've got some excellent writers and arrangers, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that have actually written music. I think we could use more of this where they actually write arrangements where it's built into the song. Mm. And, you know, the Hamiltons are, are uh, majesty music. Um, they've served the local church for a long time. And, uh, um, they have done some great arrangements that actually involve a choir orchestra if you have it yeah. but then there's also spots for the congregation to come in and they're just singing you know the melody perhaps and then the musicians are harmonizing around it and yeah. i think i think we'd use more of that right that that sounds fascinating to me. Yeah. um so first of all, I, I do have to comment I, I am really glad to hear 
a dispensationalist who's not afraid of the Old Testament. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, I heard the story of a, a man who, Dal- who graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary. And at graduation, as he was walking across the stage, shook hands with the president, gave him his diploma, and he said, can I have my Old Testament back now? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, dispensational joke. I love it. <laughs> All right. So, I don't have a good one to return at the moment. I'll have to think about it. <laughs> now, um, I want to ask, so, like, and this is kind of, we're, we're kind of shotgunning this and, and with, a, with a blast of things here and there. What advice do you have for the person in the pew? Although a lot of churches don't have pews anymore. But anyway, you get what I'm saying. Right. <laughs> you know, what advice do you have for me? So here I am. I am not a musician in any way, shape, or form, although I do own a banjo. Um, and I can play the doxology on it, which is not typically a banjo song. But That is um, unique. I, that is very unique, <laughs> I have to say. So, you know, I, I don't, I can't really read music. I don't sing very well, but I'm sitting in a pew or I'm standing and we're singing. And there are times, you know, I feel overwhelmed um, in the sense of I can't sing with the guy up there, whether it's a worship team or a music team. And there are times I just feel inferior, like maybe I should just shut up and listen to everyone around me. What advice do you have? For, I, I know I'm not alone in that because I've talked with other people. Um, and you know, I, I deal with teenagers as well who are sitting in chapel and they're, they're almost just afraid because, you know, I don't, what if I sound off tune? What if I do that? Or, well, first of all, I have two responses to that. First, you're talking to someone where uh, that's difficult for me to imagine because I'm on the other side of it. And that's not an arrogant statement at all. It's just that I've not been in that specific situation yeah. where I've been unable to musically, um, you know, identify with what's going on. But I will draw on an experience that I had back in 2015. I lost my voice due to acid reflux. And there was three months where I could, I wasn't even supposed to talk. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I get my voice back. And um, I remember being fr- frustrated and a whole new world opened up to me where I couldn't communicate with people. And then we went to church and had some opportunities where, you know, obviously we weren't the ones I wasn't preaching. I wasn't singing. I was sitting there and I heard the congregation singing and it wasn't that I didn't understand it, but I, I wasn't allowed to sing along. Yeah. And that really opened up my eyes to, wow, I really, this, I don't like this, you know, this, yeah. this is painful for me. So let me use that to lead into the second <laughs> part. What I did instead was I tried to make eye contact with those people who were part and to encourage them on their way. So for example, yesterday in church, uh, we were at a church where um, uh, we have a couple weeks off as we recharge here. And we were at a church where a, a young lady got up to saying, I don't know how old she is. I'm assuming she's college age, but I'm horrible at guessing ages. So I've just decided yeah. to stop doing that. But she got up and um, a lot of people, um, I th- she knew who I was as far as, you know, singer and all that stuff. So I could tell she was a little nervous and she kept looking at me when she was singing. <laughs> And of course, yeah. I don't want that. I don't want someone to be self-conscious because I happen to be sitting in the congregation in the audience. So I made it my goal to encourage her as she was singing her song. So I, I made eye contact. I nodded my head. Yeah. You know, I said amen a couple times just to, oh, I appreciate it. And I listened to the music and, and I allowed it to touch my heart. It was a challenge. Uh, and then also I made an active effort to encourage that person. Cause you and I both know that particularly in certain parts of the country and certain, it's not even parts of the country. It's just certain uh, subcultures where people will tell you afterward that they enjoyed the music or the preaching or whatever, but they don't, it's like, there's a moratorium on showing it on your face. Right. Right. It's like, you know, I, it's like, We're Baptist, I, you don't do that. that's emotion. Exactly. That's right. We, we do not do that. We do not allow the speaker or the musician to know that we are enjoying this or being a, having a blessing at all, <laughs> you know, so I try to buck that trend. So that's a long answer, but to answer your question, if you're not able to participate, whether it's an ability issue or uh, something where like me, your voice is out or whatever, make it your mission to 
to participate in the sense of, yes, yeah. maybe you're nodding your head. Just just go an extra step maybe to allow that person or group or whatever. If they find you in the audience, and believe me, even in a group of 6,000 people that I've sung to, I still look for those people who are engaged with what I'm doing, and I come back to them as I'm, as I'm looking. So that's an idea, at least. Okay, we're going to stop our conversation right there. Actually, the conversation keeps on going, but we're going to make this into a part two. So part two will be next week. We're going to continue, and I'm going to be asking the question, what do you do if you don't like the song that's being sung? But before we close out today, I have another special guest... And that's one of Ben's fans, and that's my son, Tommy. Tommy, welcome to our podcast. Hi. Okay, so I'm going to ask you, what do you what do you like about Ben's music? Uh, it's great. What about it that's great? Um, it speaks to the heart. It speaks to the heart, okay. So anything else you want to say before I wrap this up? Uh. Now, I, Tommy didn't know I was going to do this. I just pulled him out. He was watching TV. And I pulled him out because he, has, he was asking questions about the podcast, so he became an automatic guest of the podcast. So anyway. Keep on going. Good job. All right. So uh, we'll have links to Ben's site, again, BibleRevival.com, and uh, we'll have some more resources we're going to talk about next week. But also check out Ben's podcast. We talk about that. My Forte. Uh, ben has got a great uh, – it, it, they're really short and easy to listen to but yet worth the time. So anyway, uh, check out our website at www.basicbiblepodcast.org where you can find all that info. Also, check us out on the socials, on Facebook. Check out our Facebook group, then on Twitter and um, Instagram at Basic Bible Cast. Uh, Tommy wants to say something. Make sure you listen carefully. Okay, good job, Tommy. And then uh, we're still on TikTok, I think, somewhere. In fact, we're going to have uh, a quick video. I'm going to update next week. So be aware of that. Next week, I'm actually going to update TikTok to uh, have a little little clip Ben and I did uh, that was kind of cool, a video clip. So anyway, so until next time, have a good rest of your week.